Hello, everyone, and welcome to another segment of Sage Advice. I am Greg Tito, and I'm joined by Jeremy Crawford. Hi, everyone. How's it going? I'm doing well. Yeah? Yeah. All right, good. I had a long weekend because of the little snow flurry we had. It was snow flurry-y. I was away uh, uh, in San Juan Island, and we got quite a bit of snow when we were there. And and I was also recuperating after finishing Morden Kanan's Tome of Foes. Congratulations. It's out the door. Yes. Exactly. It's being printed as we speak. Gosh, that's crazy to think about. We should do like one of those uh, 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 Mr. Rogers type segments where we go to like, this is how a book is made. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. We'll start here and then it'll end up at the printer and like, right. they put the glue here. And then everybody could be like, oh, that's why the, all of our pages are messed up. We, we should remember that for a future Sage Advice segment. We I should. I could just talk about how a D&D book is made. Exactly. Yeah. That's a good idea. Yeah. Right. Put it in our brain pad. Yeah, because I'm, I'm going to actually write a note about that. Today, we, uh, we're trying to come up with a good topic for this uh, and uh, mounted combat is where we settled on to start with. Yes, yeah, because we have never done a segment specifically on mounted combat, but it does generate a number of questions. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I mentioned I I, I rarely use it because it doesn't, uh, uh, unless your character is made for mounted combat, it doesn't always make sense in my mind. Uh, But I'm sure we can figure out a little bit more about why uh, and and how easy it is to to integrate without it making, you know, uh, having to create all these choices ahead of time. Right, right. Uh, so uh, what, what's the what's the basic of, of mounted combat that uh, you, you wanted to get across here? So, so first off, to get at the kind of bigger picture question of how to include mountain combat, why should you include it? Why is it even in the game? Yeah, uh, because a lot of adventures take place in dungeons inside castles with narrow corridors. And so there are many adventures where mounted combat won't even come up because mm-hmm. uh, D&D adventurers spend a remarkable amount of time indoors, not unlike those of us who play the game. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so you might have multiple campaigns where your characters are never on a mount. Uh, but then suddenly you might have a, uh, a paladin in your group who's cast Fine Steed, or you might have a tricksy ranger beastmaster who is maybe a halfling or a gnome and figured out they can turn their uh, beast companion into a mount, which by the way is perfectly legal. Wow. Uh, and, or you might be uh, in a campaign that involves a lot of wilderness exploration uh, or might have a uh, more sort of warlike theme where cavalry charges are a thing. Uh, or you might have a more sort of like mythologically themed campaign where like heroes of old, you know, you are astride your mighty steed and yeah. you're, you're going to face the dragon out on an open field. There are so many like tropes associated with it, too. I mean, I'm thinking of, you know, the, the writers of Rohan and uh, even uh, Atreyu and his mount and in, in, yes. in Never Ending Story. Ooh, nice, nice call out to Never Ending Story. I love that movie. Yeah. It holds up. <laughs> I, a little I, bit. I actually rewatched it last year, and more of it held up than I expected. Yeah, I think there was a point where I was like, "Nah, this is no good." You know, maybe in my mid twenties, mm-hmm. and then like now, I'm like, you know what? No, it's 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 it pulls at the right heartstrings in the right way. Yeah, the, uh, but the, yeah, the but like that, got us. that uh, a bond that he has with his with his horse. Yes. Uh, oh, I'm forgetting the name of it, but then also even uh, a Falcor and and the mm-hmm. riding a dragon is is part of mounted combat too. Yeah, Gandalf and Shadowfax. Yes, uh, and. Uh, yeah, the, it it is such a a classic image of not only the knight in shining armor uh, astride a horse, but you know again Gandalf a wizard on top on a horse. Uh, many heroes in myth and in fantasy literature are often associated with a mount of some kind. Yeah, uh, and it's something again because of the fine steed spell or the fine greater steed spell that appears in Xanathar's, Xanathar's Guide to Everything that we have at least one class that is highly motivated to have a mount. Mm -hmm. Uh, Cavaliers, uh, that subclass that also appears in Xanathar's Guide to Everything, also has uh, this desire often to include a mount in some way. Right, so uh, it's a shame to let it fall by the wayside. Uh, and, and yeah, how do we, how do we integrate it more uh, in, into your game? So part of that is DMs uh, just designing more outdoor encounter opportunities. And also to remember that uh, in all of those points and adventures where people are traveling long distances from one place to the next, that unless they're traveling uh, by river or by sea or by air, uh, often they're going to want to get on uh, 
a horse or some other kind of mount uh, to make that journey. Mm -hmm. And whether because it's a random encounter on the journey or because the villains are hunting the adventurers down, there are actually many opportunities to have encounters uh, that will involve the mounts. Uh, now, not all mounts are going to be combat ready. Uh, you can imagine a typical riding horse or a donkey, you know, freaking out uh, when battle breaks out. Uh, and you could have situations where the DM decides that the mounts are more of a liability than, mm -hmm. uh, than an aid. Uh, also, on the top of many players' minds is if they're playing a character who uh, cares about the welfare of the animals, they're often going to want to get the animals out of there as quickly as possible so that they're not gobbled up uh, by whatever monster has suddenly you know, reared its ugly head. Uh, but however a DM decides to integrate mounts uh, into the game, yeah. and it's something I did uh, quite a bit of, not in my current campaign, which is a very urban horror game, but in my previous campaign, which was very Celtic themed with a lot of battles mm. out in open countryside. There are actually very few battles in my previous campaign that took place indoors. Uh, often there were opportunities for mounts. And to be clear here, when we're talking about mounts, we're not just talking about horses, although horses are the most iconic. Uh, a mount can be any creature that is suitable for you to ride around on. So mm. in my previous campaign, that included, you know, at one point wyverns that their foes were writing, you know, it can in certain stories, like in Dragonlance uh, tales can include being astride dragons themselves. Yeah. Uh, there are pegasi in the game, uh, all sorts of creatures uh, that you can uh, use as mounts. Um, so the base requirement for a creature to be your mount is that it be at least one size category larger than you. So most humanoids in the game are medium, some are small. And so it means, okay, they need, to, they need to be at least one size category bigger than you. Mm -hmm. So it's normally going to mean large. Uh, it, they also have to be willing. A monster that, or, a monster or, or animal or what have you is not going to be your mount unless it's been trained to be your mount or it wants to be your mount. Uh, so again, that willingness is important. And then there's a part that's really up to the DM, and that is, does the creature have an anatomy that lends itself to being a mount, to bearing the weight of another creature without that, that weight bearing inhibiting the creature's movement too much. Right. Now, one way a DM can uh, ascertain this is take a look at the creature's strength and using the rules on strength, see what the creature's carrying capacity is. Uh, keeping in mind that there are some creatures where we talk about oh they they can uh, they're unusual and they can carry more than more than normal uh, but i wouldn't get too hung up on that as a dm i would say really just sort of go with your narrative gut if something is horse like you know that strong and four legged yeah. uh, it's it's likely it can it can bear the weight of a creature that is you know one or more sp one or more sizes smaller than it mm -hmm. um, this rule is here partly because, and this has been true for many editions of D&D, anytime there are mounted rules and, and, you know, if they ever refer to someone being bigger, of course, someone's going to ask, can the halfling ride the paladin around? <laughs> because, <laughs> because the paladin, uh, let's say we're talking about a half-orc paladin uh, who's medium size, size yeah. and, the, and the halfling uh, is, uh, is small. It's like, well, if the half orc is willing and he's <laughs> one size larger, uh, can't he be a mountain? So that's why we say, DM, does this person have a suitable anatomy? Sure, that half orc is probably really strong, but most of us, if we had someone bearing down on our shoulders all the time, we can do it for a little while. I mean, many of us have, you know, had kids up on our shoulders yeah. at, at different times, but imagine doing that for hours on end. Oh. You know. I've done it for hours on end <laughs> and regretted it for, for weeks to come. Right. Yeah, right. exactly. It's not, we're not made for that. Yeah. So normally when we think of a, of a creature with an appropriate anatomy, we're thinking of something that's a quadruped, or it could be also something uh, that maybe is like giant and worm-like, you know, mm. if like you could actually get one to be willing. Uh, 
Dune style. You could imagine, say, yeah, riding around, yeah, yeah, riding around on a big purple worm, which yeah. would be pretty fantastic. What do you? <laughs> <laughs> so, if you if you've met that requirement, that the creature is an appropriate anatomy, it's big enough, and it's willing, hop on. Uh, then the question is, well, how do you hop on? Yeah. So our game has open-ended movement rules. So you know, getting up next to your mount, you move up next to it. How the same way you move up next to anything in D and D. Now, getting up onto the mount does have a special rule, and these rules I'm referring to are in the combat chapter of the player's handbook, and there's a section at the very end of the combat rules called Mounted Combat, and I actually have uh, the book open to that page. Perfect. Um, and one of the special rules there is once you're, once you're adjacent to this mount, to get up on it, you need to spend an amount of movement equal to half your speed. This is actually just the like the rule for standing up from when you're prone. Okay. The reason why this is a variable amount, so you know, it's essentially an amount of movement that changes depending on uh, what your speed is. The point is we want a, you to burn half your potential movement, whatever your speed is, uh, because you're not just moving. This is also representing, you know, you're kind of climbing on, you're getting into place, you're situating yourself, you're getting the reins if there are reins, or mm -hmm. you're grabbing onto the creature's mane or to its horns or whatever it is you're grabbing onto. This represents not just getting there, it's getting situated, you're ready to go. Right. Uh, a DM, I could imagine, might allow somebody to mount faster uh, and then... Uh, you know, if a person's really in a panic, the DM might say, okay, you can mount faster than that, and then maybe imp impose disadvantage on uh, the next check the person makes or their next attack roll or the next saving throw they make. So, Or you could be, I mean, there's, I'm just throwing this out there, but like I'm thinking of uh, uh, a few fantasy films I've seen where there's a very acrobatic mounting of a horse or yes. like flipping around uh -huh. and doing on that. And if you roll a high uh, DC acrobatics check, you might allow something like that. And, and in fact, as DM, I have allowed that very thing. I've, uh, I am, as I've mentioned before in Sage Advice, I am very generous and encourage other DMs to be very generous when players are creative and use their character's capabilities in fun, cinematic ways. And so mm. if I have a character who, yeah, they're gonna try to do some, you know, crazy Legolas flip style thing. Yeah, yeah up onto their horse and I, i'll say yeah go ahead give me give me that acrobatics check and if they nail it bam they're on the horse and i probably won't charge them extra movement at all for that yeah uh, but there's always the risk if they fail that check then i'm probably going to have some some pratfall happen or like they they not only didn't make it on the mount but they, they lose might their action <laughs> or or they land in you know the water trough on the <laughs> other side uh, you know there are all sorts of fun things that can happen yeah. uh, cuz really any time you hand you as a dm decide to hand over some of the decision making to the d20 Part of that decision making as DM is get ready for crazy, uh, <laughs> <laughs> because crazy good and yeah, crazy bad. Exactly, because the D twenty, as as I've talked about before, is so swinging uh, that, and part of the fun of D and D is even the DM can be surprised by the outcome, and yeah. then you have the fun of coming up with well, what happened? Like, you just you. You vaulted right over that griffin you were trying to to land on, and you landed in the lake, you know, on the other side. Okay, and now you get to use the swimming rolls. <laughs> yeah. uh, I would even make it so <laughs> your, your trusted mount sidestepped a little bit to the left yes. uh, at the last second <laughs> uh, uh, as a getting back for you know giving a moly carrot the, yes. the night before or something yeah, like that. The little scowl at yeah, you. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Yeah. So once once you're on your mount, uh, you then have a choice, and uh, this choice point. Uh, throws people a, b a little bit sometimes, and that is you decide, am I going to control this mount or am I going to let it act independently? Mm. And we tell you in the rules that intelligent creatures, which is, and, and this is admittedly vague in the rule, they will act independently. And really here when we say intelligent creatures, we mean creatures that are uh, their own their own person, basically. Yeah, like, sentient. Yeah, like a dragon. Like, uh, think of, is does this thing have a name? Can it talk? Uh, that thing is going to act independently. Yeah. Uh, it, it's like, it's allowing you on its back. 
You're, you are welcome to communicate your desires to it, but it's entirely up to that creature whether it's going to follow your instructions. Right, but it's not like a trained horse that is bred and uh, uh, manicured only to do what you command it. Right. Uh, now, if you if you control the mount, and it has to be kind of a a, a less intelligent thing uh, that you do this with. Although I will say this, if the intelligent creature decides, mm-hmm. eh, you take it from here. <laughs> the DM and you could certainly agree that the intelligent creature has decided to be controlled because because right. really that that would in, a, in effect be a better way of us writing this rule is just saying the intelligent creature, it gets to decide. Mm-hmm. Um, you don't get to because yeah. it, it's its own person. That makes sense. Uh, so once you've made that decision, that actually has a a strong mechanical outcome. If the creature is behaving independently, like you're basically, all right, all right, Mr. Ed, you take it from here. Uh, That means your mount decides what to do. And this can be good or bad uh, because the mount might decide to do things that are not advantageous. Uh, And you especially probably do not want to allow a kind of dumb, just regular horse take the reins as it were Mm. because if it's a big battle it might just decide i'm out of here uh so uh it it can be risky to let the creature uh do its own thing but there's also an advantage when it can do its own thing it gets to take its full turns as normal uh that means it can move around on its turn it can attack on its turn it can have all the action options it would normally have does it roll its own initiative yes Yep. Yeah. It's oh. its initiative is its own. Uh, that independent creature, it just acts like any other creature on the battlefield. It's just you're on its back. Got it. Uh, that's really that's the main difference. And then, of course, again, there are these other rules in the combat chapter about getting on and off it. There are also some rules I'll, I won't go into here about, uh, you know, the potential for getting knocked off your mount. And those rules apply whether you're controlling the mount or it's acting independently. Uh the main thing is, you know, once you make this decision, that affects how much of a turn uh, your mount has. If it's independent, it acts like anybody, any other creature in the fight. Uh, and it's really up to the player and the DM who is controlling uh, that mount at the table. Because many DMs will say, even though this creature is independent and it's, it's making its own choices on the battlefield, you player go ahead and control it. And mm-hmm. I recommend that actually to most DMs. Oh yeah? Yeah. yeah Why I'm is like, that? Um, partly because DMs often have plenty of other things to control. Mm-hmm. And also because players like to have that kind of, that sense of companionship and ownership of their mount. And so even if uh, the mount is uh, an intelligent mount, uh, I would like to empower players say, hey, you get to control it. Unless, again, it's an important NPC, like you're riding on the back of a really intelligent dragon who might have knowledge uh, that the players aren't privy to, uh, or you know, the DM has maybe something in the dragon stat block that the DM doesn't want to reveal. There are situations where the DM should retain control of that creature. Right. Uh, otherwise, I'd say, uh, let the players do it. The DM already has plenty of things to keep track of at the table. And yeah. most players would enjoy, I think, controlling their mount, even if it's a, a, I mean, making decisions for the mount, even if it's acting independently. Yeah. But, and they like that duality. They like having like, oh, this is a symbiotic thing. So I'm going to make choices that the mount is doing, even though it's the mount making it. It's Ex- exactly. They're a team. It, it Because really, it's good to think of really any kind of animal companion uh, or monstrous companion in your group. Just think of it as another NPC. Mm-hmm. And sometimes DMs also will allow uh, players to control uh, humanoid uh, NPCs who join the party. You know, you might have uh, a hench person who's with you and the DM will say, okay, you, you get to go ahead and control, you know, Cynthia, the, the town guard who, who marched off into the dungeon with yeah. you. Um, now, if you decide you're controlling the mount, different rules here, because suddenly the creature's initiative change, changes to your initiative. You're now acting as a unit. Mm-hmm. It still has a turn, but its turn basically overlaps with yours. It gets its move, 
And so part of the advantage of this is basically it's moving on your turn. So it's then far easier for your character to coordinate with the mount. Right. Uh, its movement is taking place on your turn. And its action options are limited. Uh, there's kind of a good mnemonic here. We play the game called D&D. This controlled mount has the D and D and D option, <laughs> which is its only actions are dash, disengage, and dodge. Okay. Uh, and so that means it's not attacking or anything like that. It is fully dedicated at this point uh, to being a mount, to moving you around. Right. Uh, not in the like, oh, it can attack and claw and blah, or even as a horse, you know, prance it, and, and do that. It is it clearly is, a vehicle. Exactly. It is. It is focused entirely on this point, at this point, at moving you around and doing so safely. Uh, because, you know, the fact that it can disengage uh, means it can move without triggering opportunity attacks. Mm -hmm. um, and the beauty of it acting on your turn to make it easy, you know, its turn overlapping with yours is that then also your movement is still free to use on your own turn and all your actions are still available. So the mount almost becomes a movement and action extension for the rider. Mm. Uh, so that's a really powerful advantage. So even and though the mount is giving up things like attacking and whatnot, you're gaining on your turn all this potential extra movement uh, and also basically a free, for the mount at least, disengage, dodge, or dash, which in dash means even more movement. Yeah. And that's, I mean, the main reason why mounts are used in combat anyway, as you mentioned, the cavalry charge and things like that. Yes. It's literally just to get to the point faster and to smash and take advantage of, uh, uh, you know, a large scale battle, like, oh, a flank and a motion and things like that. Right. Um, and then in this case, it's more about like, oh, I can make an attack and then travel, you know, double, double movement speed away from the range of most even range weapons and then come back and make that same attack the next round. Yeah. And yeah. that's the advantage there. Yeah, and so it's actually, and it's a, it can potentially be a huge advantage. Yeah. Um, so many people, partly because it's easy as whenever any of us are playing D&D, &D, we're like, yeah, but attacks, attacks. And so people are like, all right, but what, how about we'll make the mount independent? So let's, assu uh, let's assume you do that. And it's not a creature that's just going to bolt, you know, like many horses if you say, all right, Again, Mr. Ed, you get to decide. Do whatever you want. It's out of there. Uh, and I don't want to be in this fight at all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but assuming uh, your mount is allowed to act independently uh, and decides to stay in the fight and then therefore gains the use of its own attacks, the disadvantage you now have as a rider is you're going to have to wait till the mount's turn for it to move. Mm. So there's then is the that disjointedness with mount and rider where, again, still advantageous because you're still going to get that extra movement. But it it's, can be confusing in, in it, its execution, really. Right, because it, it's, it's broken up over multiple turns. Yeah. But that's the trade-off. Uh, if, you, if, you, if it's more important to you that the mount gets, gets its attacks off rather than having all that extra movement occurring on your turn mm -hmm. in that tight coordination, then go for it. Make the mount independent. Uh, cool. But again, if it's all about let's dash around and for it to happen exactly when you want it to happen, control that mount. Um, I also, as DM, would allow you to make this decision at various points in the battle. It's not like once you decide to control the mount, hmm. it's controlled forever. Um, in that case, would you roll initiative multiple times or would you just have one that the the mount can drop in and out of? So... So when you decide to control a mount, its initiative changes to yours. And so once you've made that decision, I would leave its initiative there. I wouldn't keep changing its initiative. Oh. So even if it then became independent, like imagine you're knocked unconscious. Well, at that point, your mount, you're not controlling it anymore. Your mount becomes independent at that point. Uh, but I would still leave its initiative at that same point, uh, partly because uh, we designed the combat system so that you almost never have to change the initiative of anything. In fact, the mounted combat rules are one of the rare places where we have you change something's initiative. Yeah. Well, would, would, would that be a way to game the system a bit if you started off, uh, say, you know, independent uh, and then you wanted to get the, your initiatives matched up so you could do 
the the kind of maneuvers that you can do easier when you're similar and then like okay now they're independent again you that would definitely be one way to try to break the intent of the rule and then at that point i'd leave it to the dm because it already would be an element of dm grace yeah to allow a person to switch from controlled to independent because uh, right. the rules uh, don't have that grace built. But that's in. something that you were like, oh, I do this sometimes. Yeah, because right. again, I as a DM, I tend toward generosity, but I also part of me of the social contract in D and D is that basically when the DM is giving you a gift, graciously <laughs> accept it graciously. Yeah, uh, because actually. When I when my generosity starts to run out and then I start being an impish DM and players start vaulting into, you know, mud pits and falling in lakes <laughs> or or trip into the toilet is when <laughs> is when they start to uh, abuse my generosity. Right. You don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Yes, exactly. <laughs> well done, sir. <laughs> um, so there are a few other neat wrinkles with mounted combat. Uh, when you are on your mount and the mount uh, triggers an opportunity attack, uh, your foes have the option of attacking the mount or you. Mm. Uh, now, this introduces an interesting wrinkle that is specific to playing with miniatures. Everything I've said so far works with or without miniatures. Okay. As soon as you introduce the use of a grid, and you have actually, you know, on the grid, here's my horse miniature, and here's, here's the miniature of my barbarian, and now my miniature goes on the horse, it introduces a question that theater of the mind doesn't have, and that is, where on the horse is the barbarian? Mm. Because you're, you're now playing in a context where, you know, the exact five foot square where everything is suddenly matters. Uh, and so there I would say just follow the normal movement rules. Uh, you know, when your, when your figure moves on to the other figure, just decide which of the spaces on the mount your miniature moved on to. Uh, just, and, and so it's that easy. You, know. you say because it's a large miniature, it takes up four squares? Yes. Yep. And so you just pick one of those? Mm -hmm. And just say that's, that's where you are. But wouldn't you say you're kind of in the center? If you the, were the, the DM can make that can make that decision uh, mm. it and there's really no there's no sort of wrong answer here for the DM to say, OK, you're you know, you're in this square or that square or you're right in the middle of the square. It's just our rules don't really account Cover well that, for yeah. things that are um, partially in square, although we do have a little bit of guidance in this realm in our area of effect rules in the Dungeon Master's Guide. We're there, we talk about if, if, and this is specifically in the area of effect rules, to be clear, about circular area of effects. We do say in those rules, if a circular area of effect uh, covers at least half a square, the area of effect affects that square. So one way DMs could decide when it comes to positioning people or creatures on the grid, if they're not actually sort of snapped to the grid and, right. they're, and they're overlapping several squares, if the miniature uh, is filling at least half the square, you can say, okay, the miniature is technically in that square. Um, and So you can kind of use that as a guiding yeah, thing for, yeah. for this too. And I, and I think in general, that's a good rule of thumb is, you know, if, this is as opposed to if, you know, just a tiny bit of the miniature is, is going over the line into, into another square. Uh, I would generally say in, in the times when I do use miniatures that, nah, you're not really there. Yeah. Um, but again, that's that's a determination I make, you know, scene by scene as a DM, uh, depending on how things were described uh, and whatnot. Uh, although honestly, I think, uh, and and again, it's fine if people decide to use miniatures. But you often, if you're doing high speed cavalry charges, <laughs> roaming battles in open country, I would say in most cases, don't use miniatures because uh, that'll just confuse more than illustrate well plus it you'll you'll quickly find out as i have many times since i i have actually i i'm getting to the point where i've run almost more combats in outdoor circumstances than indoor circumstances in my my multiple decades long career as a dm uh often you, your table's not big enough right. uh, because if you have a really exciting 
battle on the run with horses and dragons and wyverns and pegasi and griffins and other mounts or, you know, carriages that are barreling, you know, dr- you know drawn by four horses at top speed. Yeah. Uh, slowing that down to moving things square by square, A, can, can sometimes suck some of the excitement out of it. But then again, also often your table is just not big enough. Uh, for the distances that are going to be covered. There's a reason why war gamers use, you know, 12 foot tables in order to do what they do. <laughs> right. Right. And right. They take up the most space in the game store because of that reason. It's yeah. Just, you know, right. It needs that that scale in yeah. order to make it feel epic. Yeah. Right. And so if you can't deliver that on a, you know, a small, you know, card table or something like that, it's it's just, yeah, you're right. It's not worth it. Yeah. And also I agree with you. I think the epic nature of it, or the cinematic nature is kind of, I mean, we, we started this off talking about how mountain combat has this this kind of movie-like or, 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 or cinematic character. And if you're not getting that across with the, the miniatures, it's better just to keep it into that, that arena of, of how you describe it. Yeah. Now, if people decide they do want to kind of zoom in uh, to, to sort of almost like, again, c- continuing on with the cinematic metaphor, you know, they want to go in for a close-up. Yeah. Uh, you know, knock yourselves out. It's fine to use miniatures and consider using this rule of thumb about positioning miniatures uh and you you can make it simple on yourself and just snap to the grid uh and i know i know some people it will it will feel aesthetically odd that their miniature is like only on the front of the you know only in one corner of the horse basically but it helps but you know it's a game yeah and and there are many things whoa, whoa, whoa. what i know i hate to break that down. <laughs> <laughs> this is a game it's life <laughs> <laughs> and we and we will often make choices that uh, are, you know, walking that tightrope uh, between uh, smooth, fun gameplay and uh, believable world building. Right. And, and I think it's important to try to always sort of stay somewhere in the middle uh, because people want that sense of immersion. But we also want a game that's going to keep moving, keep keep the story exciting, Mm -hmm. uh, always be in service to the narrative uh, and to the thrill of of whatever it is that's going on. You mentioned uh, uh, a couple other wrinkles with Mounted Combat other than the uh, opportunity attacks? Uh, The, well, and then again, how it relates to especially miniatures use because when you're using miniatures, then you'll see, especially with opportunity attacks and really any uh, attack, range becomes a very big issue Mm -hmm. and reach especially for a melee attack because where you are then on the mount could then affect uh how well you can be targeted by someone who's not on the mount yeah uh so again it requires some as soon as you introduce miniatures it it definitely is going to require a bit more adjudication on the dm's part um there are also some other things in the game that can enhance Mounted combat. There are, you know, the subclasses I mentioned. Um, uh, well, and, well, the subclass, the cavalier, and then paladins, uh, who have the fine steed spell. There's also uh, the mount- mounted combatant feat uh, that will make you more effective as a rider, and some magic items as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there are also, other than fine steed, other spells that can also introduce mounts to the game. The Phantom Steed spell is, is an example of one of those. Uh, now, one of the spells, actually the spell, uh, that often generates the most questions related to the mounted combat rules is the Fine Steed spell. Yeah. Because people have often asked me, uh, is the Fine Steed, I mean, is the Fine Steed, is the Found Steed. <laughs> the Steed uh, that you find. <laughs> is it intelligent or not? And because... They're asking this question because of the rule, uh, you know, where you decide is, are you going to control the mount or is it going to act independently? And the, the spell says that you and, you and the steed fight as a cohesive unit uh, and, you know, you can communicate with it and it serves you. Mm-hmm. And really what that means is it's, it's up to you. Uh, because whether it's intelligent or not, well, no, it's up to you whether to control it or to let it act independently. Oh, I see. Right. Uh, it because I think I think sometimes when I've been asked this question, and it sort of it I early on in the editions lifespan a few years ago, these questions came up, 
and I think I sometimes misunderstood the motivation for the question mm. uh, because I, I'm thinking people were asking this because they were wondering, do I have a choice? Uh, you know, is it intelligent enough that it will always act independently? And the spell, again, says, so this is an unusually intelligent animal because part of the effect of the spell also is that its intelligence gets increased. Yeah. But the spell also tells you, you fight as a cohesive unit and it serves you, uh, which, you know, I want to make it clear to everyone listening, what that means is it's your choice. You decide when you when you hop on, are you controlling it this time or is it an independent uh, it's not a, a the spell doesn't determine that for you right exactly Got you it. have you have liberty uh, a, as the player to decide each time you mount it all right is it this time going to act on its own or am I controlling it keeping in mind that one of the huge advantages of that mount is you know it's not going to screw you over <laughs> because part of part of the, it is loyal it is loyal yeah. and the two of you are cohesive and can communicate with each other uh, etc so it, which i think is what we all want from our mounts yes really. yeah i i want my horse buddy <laughs> he bends <laughs> with us although really i want my unicorn mount yes and it should be intelligent yes. uh, mostly just so you can have conversations with it when you're you know on your own yes yeah <laughs> What Recli about reclining in a beautiful forest glade. <laughs> what about uh, 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 pole arms and uh, uh, spears and that kind of, uh, like a joust? Like how would you adjudicate a joust uh, uh, in, in, using amount of combat rules? So uh, there, there are no specific rules for, for things like a joust. Uh, there are a variety of ways you could adjudicate a contest like that. Uh, one of the easiest ways, and easy because you can just use the rules you already have, is have the two writers write at each other and just have each of them make attack rolls uh, and then decide, well, if they both hit, you know, whoever got the higher roll scored the mightier hit. Uh -huh. And if anyone has been to a Ren Faire, uh, you'll uh, you often hear the announcer saying, you know, it's a mighty strike or, you know, <laughs> so it's so really you're just rolling to see who had the mightier of the strikes. Or if one of them missed and one hit, well, then obviously uh, the one who hit uh, got the blow in. And then the DM could could also determine thresholds where uh, either you need to get a certain attack roll to dismount the person, or it might be uh, that might be determined by a separate saving throw where you first see if you can hit the person, and then they need to make a strength saving throw to hang on and and stay on on their horse. Right, because it's it's yeah, it encompasses both those facets of how good you are, and then if you get hit, how do you stay on? Yeah. yeah. Now if if a DM doesn't want to use the combat rules at all, you could also just make a series of uh, ability check contests. Uh, for instance, you could do a sequence of strength athletics uh, contests between uh, the two writers. Although in this case, I think it's a bit better to, to make attack rolls because you are actually riding forward with something that is a weapon in our game. Yeah. Uh, but because there are no rule, there's really no right or wrong way of doing this. I mean, it really should be, you know, what is the what is the feel the DM's going for? Right, and uh, you would want. I mean, if someone had taken a, a, a feat or or subclasses that were designed around mounted combat, you would want those to be taken into effect. Yes. Yep. And and another reason why I would lean toward in a joust using attack rolls is I would expect. A fighter, for instance, to be better at jousting than, say, a wizard. Mm. Uh, and uh, if you lean into the combat rules, that is more likely to be the case. That makes sense. Um, whereas as soon as you open it up to just general ability checks, well, then, you know, the... Anybody could be good at, yeah. The, the lore bard is going to hop right on and woo, yeah. I won. <laughs> Although that could be a really fun scene. Yeah, yeah uh, right. And, and now I'm thinking of, was Gandalf good at jousting? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. He does have a sword, and he, don't, he uses it pretty well. Maybe, maybe if we ever get the you know the secret tales of what Gandalf the Grey <laughs> was doing, you know, all the centuries while he was wandering around, maybe for a while, just right. he was bored and decided I'm going to. 
participate in jousts. And then the, then he moved on to pipeweed. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> the Blue Wizards. Who knows what they're up to? Yep. Then then he was after the found the pipeweed. He was just too chill to de- to joust anymore. <laughs> I, oh man, I just rewatched uh, a Fellowship of the Ring, and there's definitely uh, some shade being thrown by Saruman to that effect. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yep. When he first when he first yeah. goes to Orthanc, Saruman is like, "Whoo, buddy." Yeah, the weed is clouding you. <laughs> He's like, what? I thought that was Radagast. <laughs> <laughs> I'm cool. I'm fine. Yep. Yeah. Uh, well, if people have uh, questions about uh, wizards uh, uh, jousting uh, or any other mounted combat uh, things, how can they get in touch with you, Jeremy? Uh, the best place to reach me is on Twitter, where I am Jeremy E. Crawford. Awesome. And uh, you can follow me at Greg Tito, though I, I, I know less about mounted combat than Jeremy does. Uh, and, uh, yeah, of course, uh, we'll have to have you back and ask you more questions about uh, all of these facets of fun rules in Sage Advice. So. I'm, I'm always delighted to do it. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye, everyone. There was a lot. There is a lot and there. I'm sure someone on Twitter will tell me, but you didn't mention X. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. There will always be. Yeah. Uh, everybody's saying thank you. Uh, thank you guys uh, so much for uh, watching our live recording today. I think that's all uh, That's all we got going on. Uh, o- always have lots of fun stuff on our Twitch channel, though, so check back uh, tomorrow. It starts off with Mike doing – have you been watching Mike's uh, uh, Happy Fun Hours? Oh, I – I haven't, uh, mostly because he's been doing it while I was finishing Morton Cannon's Oh, Homophos. that's right. So, so. tomorrow, you got you got to jump in. I think he's doing the Rogue Acrobat uh, uh, subclass tomorrow. And and I have been, he, he has told me apparently there are murmurings about getting me on the show uh, to develop his design. Ooh, uh, nice. Because yeah, I guess there have been some questions about, you know, <laughs> is this stuff balanced? and. <laughs> And I am generally the person who needs to come in and say, you are, well, maybe not so much. <laughs> you are <laughs> the implementer. It's great. Yeah, you're like, oh, it's great. It's, <laughs> it's fine. Great. It's, it's for the kids. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> uh, well, cool. I can't wait to do that, to have you guys do it as a, as, as a duel. Uh, it would be pretty fun. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then at two, we got uh, Dragon Plus with uh, Bar Carroll. He's talking to uh, our friends from BCOM about their uh, 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 Tales from Candlekeep, as well as Matt Chapman from Dialect talking about the new Dragon Plus issue, which is... Uh, uh, releasing today, if not actually tomorrow. I think it's supposed to go today. Uh, so if you don't know about Dragon Plus, it is an app you can get on your uh, iOS, Android phone, or on the web at dragonmag.com. It's got two, uh, uh, sorry, we do this every uh, uh, two months uh, is what I'm trying to say. Bi-monthly, that's the term. Um, and yeah, interviews, uh, news, images, uh, stuff you can't get anywhere else, uh, all on that uh, uh, app on Dragon Plus. Uh, he'll be talking more about that, uh, uh, I think, from 2.30 to 3 with Matt Chapman. Uh, as well, I'll be back at 3.30 for D&D News, uh, warming up the channel for Dice Camera Action episode 80. Two, uh, Rachel Seeley will be returning again, uh, and uh, a lot of stuff will be happening there. Ooh, I was going to have uh, – uh, i, I got to make sure I have the updates on all this. Um, but, yeah, that's our big scheduled day tomorrow. Uh, Wednesday we're hosting uh, the – oh, I'm sorry. Finally, uh, Miss Clicks, uh, 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 Anna Prosser Robinson, uh, our uh, Evelyn from Dice Camera Action, is uh, doing her – Uh, I guess second session dungeon mastering uh, for a live stream at 6.30 p.m. uh, Pacific time tomorrow. So go check that out. She's jumping into the the dungeon master behind the screen, and I'm excited about that. Uh, So so go check that out. We're hosting on Wednesday, uh, C-Team, and then a whole bunch of fun stuff happening on Thursday, including... 5 p.m. Pacific time, Trapped in the Birdcage, a new show uh, with Holly Conrad as Dungeon Master uh, doing her Planescape thing. It looks awesome. They just started last week. I didn't get a chance to watch it because I was on vacation, but you should go check it out. It might be a rebroadcast. We might show the first episode again, uh, depending on uh, the travel of the group, um, but definitely something you should check out and put on your schedule to watch in the future. Good fun stuff. She loves Planescape, uh, and I think the players uh, and the artwork that I've been seeing coming out of that look amazing. So... Good stuff happening. Thank you again so much uh, for everything you guys uh, have been doing here and following along on the on the channel. Again, thank you for subscribing, and uh, we uh, will be back uh, tomorrow. All right.
Anything you want to say, Jeremy? No, that all sounded great. All right, I'm I'm curious about this Planescape game. I know it's it's exciting. I love Planescape. It's it's fantastic. Uh, I feel like its tendrils go into everything we do. Uh, so I'm excited to have like uh, uh, that be. You know, no. I mean, I think we talk about it a lot here, but like mm-hmm. having it be more in the into the D and D zeitgeist is always better. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So many folks just randomly be like, "Do you know, how come this not in print?" I'm like, "Well, there's a lot of stuff there. There's a lot of material out there. It's fun." Yeah. All right, you guys are the best. Uh, we'll be back uh, tomorrow, starting at one, with Mike Morales in his uh, happy fun hour. Bye, guys. <laughs>